Two things first, before we start the video. Number one, I am not a lawyer, so none of this is legal advice. Uh, number two, videos that begin with legal disclaimers are the best videos. We are in a small country courtroom the kind of place where red flag laws are usually put into action. Now, Tennessee doesn't have a red flag law, but on the 21st of August, our Governor Bill Lee will call a special legislative session and ask our General Assembly to pass one. Now, if this were a normal T-Rex video, there would be a lot of hilarious jokes that nobody notices and funny movie clips that, uh, you know, nobody really remembers, but this is a very serious and in some ways painful subject, so we're not going to do that. But don't worry, this is only everything wrong with red flag laws part one. There will be later parts to this particular series and uh, we'll put movie clips for Minority Report and Groundhog Day and all the obvious connections. So yeah, that'll be good. But let's ask the question now, what is a red flag law? It's a little bit confusing because somewhere between 19 and 23 states have passed laws that allow for the confiscation of guns with minimal process. Uh, and Washington DC should be included, of course. And the reason there's a little bit of ambiguity about which states have them and which don't is because it's not always clear what a red flag law is. Some jurisdictions call them extreme risk protection orders. Some call them gun violence restraining orders. They all have different processes and different people can start the process, but what they have in common is that they all provide a much faster way to seize firearms with a much lower burden of proof than our legal system usually requires. And the other thing that they have in common is how they're passed into a law. A much faster emergency action with a lower level of deliberation than our legislative system usually requires. And it's always right after an extremely tragic shooting. Connecticut was the first state to pass a red flag law after a shooting at their lottery headquarters in 1999. California passed theirs in 2014 after a mass shooting at Isla Vista, but most red flag laws were passed immediately after the 2018 Parkland school shooting. Florida's own red flag law was passed just three weeks later and it was named the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Public Safety Act after the school where 17 people were murdered. And that pattern is playing out right here in Tennessee exactly the same way. On March 28th of this year, three adults and three young children were brutally murdered at Covenant School in Nashville. And there has been fierce pressure for our legislature to pass a red flag law ever since. And I'm talking a lot of pressure. We got professional protesters coming in. We had children being bussed in by their teachers. There was pushing, there was screaming. There were thousands of angry phone calls, mostly from New York area codes, interestingly enough. Uh, there was ridicule from the mainstream media. There was scolding from the White House. Uh, white powder was sent to the Cordell Hall legislative offices the other day. People have been doxing uh, the private addresses of Republican representatives and calling for their houses to be burned down. Death threats are being sent to them. Death threats are being aimed at their children. This is, uh, this is all happening in Tennessee right now. And last year, the federal government uh, set aside $750 million to give to states that do pass red flag laws. So. This is going to be an ongoing conversation that comes to a state near you. And the reason that there needs to be so much emotion and pressure and threatening and bribing to pass these red flag laws is because they have some significant downsides. The first is massive violations of your constitutionally protected human rights. Let's go over our Bill of Rights and see how the red flag laws usually violate them. Obviously, there's the Second Amendment, which is the right to keep and bear arms. You can own, possess, carry, keep, have access to arms, ammunition, uh, all of that stuff. And this cannot be taken away from you by the government. Now, the other thing that the government's not allowed to do, according to the Fourth Amendment, is the unreasonable searches and seizures. And 
Red flag laws obviously do this, and they specifically allow the seizure of guns. And guns are legal. It's not a crime to own them, so to seize them requires some other crime and a serious crime. The Fifth Amendment says that serious criminal charges need to come from a grand jury. Uh, and then the Sixth Amendment says that once those criminal charges have been brought by the grand jury, you get a fast and public trial with another jury, and the accused can always face his accusers, usually from right here. Now, a lot of red flag laws allow for ex-party proceedings, which means that only one person is required. The accused doesn't even know that stuff is going on, let alone have the opportunity to face his accusers. And then the 14th Amendment just double downs on this, saying that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Now, due process of law is a big deal. All 50 states right now do have mechanisms to remove people's property if it is dangerous, to remove people's liberty if it is truly just, and the 27 states that still have capital punishment on the books can even remove someone's life. But remember, these are super high level consequences and they require a super high burden of proof and evidence and confirmation. Due process matters because it's the only way to be sure that justice is being done when these extreme consequences are put into effect. It takes time and it needs to be deliberate and that is very deliberately spelled out on purpose by our founding documents. But some people don't want to wait. They don't think that this time is a feature. They think it's a bug. There has to be a way to disarm people faster. There has to be a way to make it okay to move quickly without the due process. Uh, there has to be a way to spend less time looking at the evidence and more time getting the guns. There has to be a way to swoop in and take them without ever letting the owners know uh, that they're under suspicion or accused of anything. And, uh, you know, then they'd have time to run away or something. In America, you know, we do have some faster processes. We have legal proceedings with a lower bar, a lower burden of proof and less procedure because the stakes are lower, like in civil court. It's a big difference between criminal court and civil court because there's a big difference between criminal and civil penalties. And a great example of this would be uh, regular restraining orders. Again, every state has a slightly different burden of proof for those, but in general, they're so easy to comply with, and the penalties for non-compliance are so low that a lot of jurisdictions almost make those a rubber stamp kind of deal in civil court, often ex parte, down here. And red flag proponents are essentially asking, why don't we take the high level consequences for serious criminal charges, you know, searching a person's home and seizing all their private property and taking items that are used to preserve life and specifically protected by the Second Amendment, uh, actions that have always required this burden of proof way up here, but then we'll enact those in a civil court with this low bar down here. After all, all we're doing is, you know, skipping a few steps. Problem is all of these steps that are getting skipped exist to protect people. They matter a lot. Uh, these protections of our human rights are the bedrock of our actual freedom and liberty, and it's very dangerous not to have them in place. And most red flag advocates actually agree this is true, but we still need to skip these protections in the name of safety. We can live dangerously if it saves even one life. Who cares as long as it works? The problem is, uh, it doesn't work. Let's look at Florida for a moment. As soon as their red flag law went into effect, Florida law enforcement began confiscating guns like crazy. Somewhere between five and 8,000 people have been disarmed in the last few years, and it's kind of hard to tell exactly how many because this law is so new that the reporting isn't fully transparent yet. But if we look at statistics that are uh, well recorded, we can see that both homicides and suicides have actually risen in the last few years. Those thousands of weapon confiscations have not had any negative effect on the overall firearm deaths, uh, even in the slightest. But that law is very new. A few years of data, probably not statistically significant. So John Lott of the Crime Prevention Research Center and Carl Moody of William & Mary College analyzed decades of statistical data from decades of red flag laws in Connecticut and Indiana, and their paper concludes that there is no significant effect on either homicides or suicides or mass public shootings. 
Another paper published by the Journal of American Medical Association shows no effect in California under their law either. And we can see that there's no effect on the individual cases either because a lot of recent high-profile mass shootings have been in states with red flag laws already. New York's red flag law did not stop the Buffalo killer, even though he was known to police and the FBI. Uh, Colorado's law did not stop the Club Q shooter, even though he had been arrested for bomb threats earlier. Uh, and even though Illinois' red flag law did disarm the Highland Park killer at one point, he was still able to get his hands on guns later. But even though red flag laws don't help, they do have an effect on the population. The Forensic Psychology Journal Behavioral Science of the Law published a study that showed that about one third of the Indianans uh, who were disarmed by these particular orders were completely innocent people. And the consequences of this can be disastrous, like for a Maryland man who was shot and killed by police when they showed up at 5 a.m. to disarm him. And these kind of disasters aren't always accidents. A disgruntled woman in Colorado filed a falsified and malicious ERPO against a police officer. And, you know, fortunately for him, it didn't go super far. But the opportunities for tragic mistakes and horrific abuses are many. And the crazy thing is that everybody knows that red flag laws don't save lives. Even the most passionate advocates of red flag laws uh, in Colorado are so disappointed with this law that they want the scope widely expanded so that a whole new category of people can start the red flag process. Uh, doctors, teachers, coworkers, a whole bunch of new people. And after the Buffalo shooting, uh, New York's governor issued an executive order saying that police officers are required to start the ERPO paperwork whenever they get a report, regardless of whom it is from. Red flag fans want more red flags, more speed, more confiscations, longer penalties for the people who are caught up in this bureaucratic paperwork, shorter delays to check the data, and I actually kind of understand that desire because there's only two ways for red flag laws to actually make any kind of statistical difference. Either you raise the bar all the way back up here, where it should be, to that higher burden of proof and you spend way more time looking at the evidence so that you catch real, actual threats. Or you lower the bar even further so that you can cast this ridiculously wide net and hope that you catch a few bad guys in the sheer volume of innocent people that you snag. Now, a law that said that quiet part out loud would fail constitutional muster, but it would also fail basic math. Remember that we have somewhere between 600 and 900 million guns in this country, and since there are only about 20,000 firearm homicides every year, some of which are justified, by the way, uh, that means that something less than 0.0025% of guns will be involved in some killing. That is tiny. Statistically speaking, you would have to confiscate a lot of guns before you would ever even touch that 0.0025% of guns. And then criminals will just always get guns illegally. An estimated 80% of gun crime is committed with illegally procured weapons. So even if you magically got all the questionable guns, you'd still never affect more than like 20% of gun crime. And uh, even then, you'd probably just be delaying it temporarily. Also, where are we getting all this unlimited police manpower? We have over 6,000 unsolved murders here in Tennessee alone, just from the last few years. Shouldn't we be using these resources to catch the actual murderers and do actual justice before we start rounding up possible, potentially preemptive murder weapons. I mean, this is a really obvious issue. We should clearly be focusing on the dangerous people who have proven themselves to be criminals, not dangerous objects that haven't. But the rhetoric around red flag laws is focused almost entirely on the firearms themselves and not the actual evildoers. Because we all know that taking somebody off the street and locking them up is a big deal. It requires a lot of proof and clear evidence and due diligence and the jury and the due process to make sure that taking away their liberty is in fact justice. That's why it's just easier to pretend like taking guns away is not a big deal and therefore you can just do it way down at the low, low level without all of the care and the caution and the deliberate protections of the individual's rights and the innocent. 
But guns are a big deal. Taking away a person's guns or ability to own guns not only deprives them of the second highest right recognized by the Bill of Rights, it also deprives them of the number one, first and foremost, best tool to stop uh, uncaptured murderers or the kinds of mass shootings that red flag laws don't stop. The Greenville shooter was not stopped by Indiana's red flag law. He was stopped by a private citizen in the mall who used his concealed carry gun to return fire and save lives. And in West Virginia last year, uh, a man with a rifle opened fire on a party and he was stopped by a woman with her concealed carry pistol. And even if West Virginia had a red flag law, which it doesn't, it would not have stopped the shooter because he was already a felon, he'd already been disarmed, uh, he was already legally prevented from possessing guns, but, you know, somehow uh, he did have a gun. He started firing into a crowd of people, and this amazing lady shot him before anybody else was hit. That is how you preemptively stop murderers, not with some kind of futuristic pre-crime department. Uh, the CDC estimates there are somewhere between half a million and three million defensive firearm usages every year. And it's very hard to know how many murders actually get stopped because it's impossible to know what would have happened in the future if that defensive firearm had not been in play. But according to various studies uh, on the FBI statistics, private citizens do a much better job of protecting themselves and other people from lethal threats than law enforcement does. During the Uvalde shooting, the SWAT team waited at the school for an hour before any action was taken and 21 people died. During the Parkland shooting in Florida, an armed deputy was actually on site uh, for the entirety of the shooting and he just waited until it was over and 17 people were dead. He was criminally charged with child neglect and culpable negligence, of course, but he was also acquitted of all of those charges about a month ago because law enforcement officers are not required to provide protection to you personally. So removing your ability to personally physically protect yourself and your legal protection so that law enforcement can somehow better protect you is backwards, especially if you uh, want to save lives. But that is not the only thing that's backwards. Let's pretend uh, just for a minute that guns are not a big deal. Even if guns had no practical use and no Second Amendment protections, the presumption of innocence is an extremely vitally important part of the American legal system. Anyone who is accused of a crime is presumed to be innocent until they have been proven guilty. This is more of that bedrock stuff. And red flag laws destroy this principle by doing the exact opposite. Once the ERPO or DVRO paperwork has been filed against you, you are now presumed to be a future murderer, or, you know, at least so likely to harm yourself and others that you must be disarmed. And it is very hard to prove that you are never gonna shoot anybody in the entire future. Now, fortunately, in most jurisdictions, there is an appeal process. The problem is that because this is happening way down here on the civil court side of things, you will be paying all of the legal bills yourself. And they're potentially quite extensive. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will not be provided for you. And this is just gonna keep an awful lot of people from ever utilizing this appeal process and from proving that they are, in fact, innocent. Uh, or that they're going to be innocent, or that they're going to continue to be innocent. This future law stuff makes grammar really, really hard. And this is where we should think a little bit wider than just the guns. There is a lot of push towards preemptive policing in other areas as well. And as cities gather more information about their inhabitants and the federal government and their agencies do more surveillance and data analytics becomes the driving decision-making force, there will be a tendency to lean more on predictions than evidence because it's currently happening in every other field in America. If you can constantly observe every even non-criminal behavior, why can't you just cleverly guess what people might do and then stop them before the crime has even been committed? Facebook does this with ads and elections, so why not do it with criminal justice? Prevention and punishment before any wrong has ever been done. But this assumes that this is uh, possible, uh, that it won't create a system that is full of misuse, 
and that it's even the government's job to protect the future collective safety as opposed to doing justice for the individual. And I think that there are two groups of red flag advocates. Those who in good faith truly believe that there is some magical sweet spot right here in the scale where if we tune it just right, we can protect everybody's human rights and catch every bad guy just, just in time. But there's another group who do want a larger and more powerful state and a more disarmed populace. And they see this as a great stepping stone on the way there. And I'm sure that they, like most of us, know that nobody will be able to predict the future well enough to catch all the pre-murderers, but the long-term consequences of cutting these kinds of corners so that you can more easily remove a people's legal protections, so that you can more quickly remove their physical protections, well, that's just how you take power away from the people and give it to the state. The Constitution doesn't just recognize our rights in a vacuum. Every right that we possess is a check or limit on the state's power. And so every legal protection that we lose is another important check or limit on the state's power that is being removed. So let's go back to Tennessee. Ever since April, there has been a lot of pressure and a lot of different bills and potential legal language just floating around out there. A number of people are working on it and suggesting alternatives. And at this point, um, we can't predict exactly what we're even talking about. Uh, for the last few months, we've been working directly and indirectly with a lot of Tennessee legislators and having conversations about this special session, and I still have no idea what is going to happen. Obviously, we know broadly what the conversation will be like. People on the left will want us to lower the bar to the point where we can take anyone's guns away just to be safe. People on the right will argue that we raise the bar so that everyone's rights are protected. But this middle ground here, this compromise, is not the sweet spot. It is the worst of both worlds. We got a burden of proof that is so sketchy that anybody uh, could get entangled in the bureaucratic and legal nightmare, but the process is still gonna be, you know, ponderous and slow, and it, you know, probably will never catch any real future murderers. Maybe uh, our law will create a new standard for proof, like other states have done, just to add some confusion for the judges that have to deal with this. Maybe the whole firearm conversation will be co-opted by a painful sidetrack into mental health, uh, remember, the governor has very specifically called everybody back because of a single school shooter with mental health issues. And I want to take a moment to say that I'm actually very sympathetic to the governor's situation. Remember that the shooting in March hit very close to home for him. One of his wife's best friends was killed. Everyone around him is still grieving and fervently wishing that something had been done, and they are convinced that this is the sort of thing that should be prevented in the future and can be prevented in the future. The right person, being in the right place, could have done it. Now, gun-free zones are usually what stop people from being in the right place at the right time, but that's, that's not the kind of hindsight everyone is using with this current red flag discussion. The hindsight is focused entirely on this exact historical scenario and stopping the wrong person from acting. And the assumption is that we will be able to predict future bad actors with the crystal clarity of our hindsight into this one. But actually, hang on. We don't actually have hindsight into this situation. We're being asked to create a new law that preemptively catches murderers like this one shooter. We don't even know the motive for this shooting. Now we should, because the murderer very helpfully wrote an entire manifesto explaining herself, but that is being suppressed by the very administration demanding the red flag law. Apparently, the contents of the murder manifesto is, uh, I mean, it's just way too much of a political bombshell to release to the public right now, but at the same time, uh, it's too insignificant or irrelevant for the, you know, legislators who are expected to make a sweeping new law based entirely on those murders. The lack of transparency around this whole red flag conversation has eroded a lot of trust into whatever this red flag law would be or could be or how it might work or how it might be implemented. And I still have no clue what will happen when the special session starts on August 21st. But one thing is very clear to me. The way that this conversation happens, 
uh, and the entire special session begins will be very important and it will give us some clues that will actually help us predict stuff. If our legislative session meets at the governor's request and they have a methodical, careful conversation with all the normal procedures in place, that will be good. But if people succumb to this pressure to do something, no matter what, uh, to take action before proper consideration, it's gonna go poorly. And if leadership moves to suspend the rules and bypass all the normal legislative committees and the due process so that they can ram through a bill that allows law enforcement to bypass their normal rules and their due process, that will make the future a little clearer, unfortunately. So that is part one of everything wrong with red flag laws, which could potentially be a super long series. So please let me know in the comments uh, what it is that you actually want to know more about in future uh, episodes. Is it the mental health stuff? Uh, is it the process stuff? This is uh, a lot of stuff that we could get into. And if you're curious about what's happening in Tennessee, subscribe to our newsletter, because that's where a lot of our political stuff goes. The newsletter and the T-Rex podcast, which you can get uh, all the places where good podcasts are, and it's censored all the places where good podcasts are censored. So check it out. <laughs>